Welcome to r slash am I the jerk, where a wild Karen pretends to be a therapist. Karen pretends to be a therapist in order to sabotage my relationship. I'm 28 male. My girlfriend Emma, who's 27, and I have been together for 6 years. For most of that time, we were happy, like really happy. The kind of relationship people say just works, you know? We were always on the same page, rarely fought, and genuinely enjoyed each other's company. But over the past year, things started to feel different. Small arguments here and there, more miscommunication, and just had this weird sense of we weren't as in sync as we used to be. It wasn't anything major, just the usual wear and tear stuff, or so I thought. Emma, however, seemed more concerned. She started pointing out issues I wasn't even aware of, like how I supposedly wasn't listening enough or wasn't as emotionally available as I used to be. I admit I'd been busy with work, but I thought we were doing okay. Still, I didn't want to dismiss her feelings. Then, about six months ago, she suggested that we go to couples therapy. Now, I've always been a bit skeptical about therapy unless things are really bad, but I agreed because I figured it couldn't hurt. She said she found a great therapist through a friend and that we should give it a try. I wasn't familiar with this Lily, but Emma was excited about it, so we booked our first session. At first, the session seemed fine. Lily asked good questions, got us to open up, and gave us some tools to communicate better. I felt like I was doing my best to listen and improve, but something about it felt off. Every time we talked about any issue, it seemed like Lily was always subtly siding with Emma. If I mentioned being stressed from work, she'd steer the conversation toward how I wasn't giving enough attention to Emma. If I brought up a disagreement, somehow it became about my communication issues. After a few weeks, Emma started using phrases like, Lily thinks you should try this, or Lily thinks you should work on that. It felt like everything I did was being scrutinized and dissected by this woman I barely knew. I didn't want to be paranoid, but it seemed like Lily was slowly convincing Emma that I was the problem in the relationship, and every time I tried to voice my own concerns, they were brushed aside. I tried to push through it, thinking maybe I was just being defensive, but it didn't stop. Every session, the same dynamic. It was like Lily was planting seeds of doubt in Emma's head and Emma was running with them. I even started to wonder if maybe I was the problem. Was I actually this bad of a partner? Things reached a boiling point a couple of weeks ago. During a session, Lily suggested that maybe we should consider a break so that I could work on myself more. That felt like a slap in the face. I'd been trying so hard to be better, and now she was suggesting that we split up? I looked at Emma, waiting for her to disagree or defend me, but she just sat there, quietly nodding along. After that session, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I blew up at Emma when we got home. I told her I didn't trust Lily's judgment, that it felt like she was just feeding Emma reasons to blame me for everything wrong in the relationship. Emma got defensive, saying I was overreacting, that Lily was just trying to help us work through our issues. We didn't talk for a few days, and I started feeling guilty for snapping. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe therapy really was exposing some flaws I needed to work on. But then something happened that blew everything wide open. Last week, we went to a mutual friend's party. While there, I overheard Emma and her friend Sarah talking in the corner, giggling about something. I caught just a bit of their conversation. I can't believe you pulled it off for this long. Poor guy still thinks she's an actual therapist. I immediately confronted them, and that's when Emma's face turned pale. Sarah quickly tried to backtrack, but the truth spilled out. Turns out, Lily isn't a licensed therapist at all. She's one of Emma's close friends from college who thought it would be fun to help Emma fix me by posing as a therapist. Emma had set this whole thing up because she thought I wouldn't agree to therapy otherwise. They figured that with Lily playing the part, they could guide me into becoming a better boyfriend without me knowing. I felt completely betrayed. For months, I had been spilling my heart out to someone who wasn't even qualified to help, and Emma had been in on it the whole time. All those sessions where I felt attacked and manipulated suddenly made sense, because I was being manipulated. When I confronted Emma about how messed up this was, she broke down, saying she never meant to hurt me and that she just wanted to help us grow as a couple. But honestly, I don't know how to move past this. I haven't been able to look at her the same since. Now, Emma and her friends are saying I overreacted, that it was just a white lie meant to help our relationship. But I feel like I've been gaslit and lied to for months. So, am I the jerk for blowing up at my girlfriend when I found out our therapist was a total fraud? Not the jerk, but what you should be doing is consulting a lawyer, because Lily was very likely practicing medicine without a license. I think you can actually take a legal action, and you really should. 
That stranger was pretending to be a licensed therapist and used it to extort information you would not share otherwise and manipulated you with it. This has to be illegal on so many levels. Besides, did they also have you pay for those sessions? This is your hill to die on. You were the victim of a crime. Lily posed as a licensed professional. Get a lawyer, sue her, press charges, and notify the proper authorities, regardless of your relationship or lack thereof with your girlfriend. We will see how long the friendship will last after that. Am I the jerk for getting a babysitter because my mom was keeping her home? I'm a single mom with a four-year-old daughter, Anna. Anna and I live with my mom. We both work and Anna goes to daycare full-time. Daycare would cost about half my income, so I get a subsidy that covers $1,400 of her $2,000 tuition. The only condition of the subsidy is that she actually has to attend. If she misses too many days, I lose the subsidy. I go to work at 7.30 and daycare opens at 8, so my mom would be the one to take Anna to daycare. Anna's main teacher is a 21-year-old woman. When I've talked to her, she's always been very animated and energetic. She's great with the kids. Anna always comes home talking about how this teacher brought stickers, juice, bubbles, did face paintings, etc. Anna always has fun crafts she did with her teacher. This teacher is her favorite person in the world right now, and Anna often runs away from my mom to jump on this teacher in the mornings. She even hides when my mom picks her up because she doesn't want to leave. My mom started to get jealous that Anna likes the teacher better than her, so she began keeping her home from daycare on her days off when she only has one to two easy clients. She cleans houses. I found out Anna missed five days over the past three weeks. I asked my mom about it and she told me she wanted Anna to spend more time with family instead of with teachers. I told my mom Anna needs to be in daycare unless she's sick or I would lose the subsidy. She argued that if Anna needs to be in daycare, she should be in one with more family values and not with some rich girl trying to save the poor kids. The teacher comes from a well-off family and is marrying into another well-off family and the daycare isn't in the most affluent neighborhood. The teacher has bins full of clothes for the kids, gave everyone a water bottle with their name on it, has a much nicer classroom than the other teachers, and drives a car worth more than my mom and I combined could make in a year. She's even setting up a field trip to the local airport so her fiancé can talk to the kids about flying planes and they can look at his jet. I told my mom I wouldn't be switching daycares. This is the best daycare that takes this subsidy and I won't move Anna just because my mom is jealous. My mom kept insisting that Anna should either be with family or at a more family-based daycare, so I got a babysitter. I now drop Anna off with my neighbor at 7.30 when I leave for work, and she drops Anna off at daycare at 8.15 on her way to take her own kids to school. She only charges me $10 a day. I don't love the breakfast she gives Anna, but at least I know Anna is getting to daycare and I won't lose the subsidy. Now, my mom is upset that I'm keeping Anna away from her. Am I the jerk for sending Anna to a babysitter in the mornings because my mom wasn't taking her to daycare? Not the jerk. Your mother is overstepping, but the correct solution, regardless of how challenging it will be, is for you to move out and handle all of this on your own. Not the jerk. You sound like a responsible parent and you did a good job solving a problem here. Congrats on getting your daughter a slot in an excellent daycare and preschool and for doing what you need to do to keep the subsidy that pays for it. Early childhood education is super important. It sounds like your daughter is learning and socializing in a positive environment and that she loves being there. That's awesome and it will help lay the foundation for future success in school. Your mom is being totally unreasonable and it sounds like you already know that. Would she be interfering with your daughter's education and keeping her home from school randomly if she was in third grade? What about 11th grade? Good luck as you continue to navigate this. You're definitely not the jerk here. Our neighbor's well dried up and we cut them off from using our water. We live in a suburban country neighborhood, USA, where all the homes rely on well water and septic systems. The neighborhood has a mix of original 1960s ranch style houses and a few newer homes from the 1990s. Our house is in one of the newer ones while our neighbors live in one of the older homes. Both of our properties have two low yield wells and one of theirs had dried up before they even moved in. Last week, their second well stopped working and they asked my wife if they could fill up buckets of water for their animals, more on this later, and their garden. My wife, wanting to be a good neighbor, naturally said yes. They've had a well company come out and have been trying to fix their wells on their own, but over the past few days, there's been no visible progress and they haven't provided us with any updates. When my wife asked them what was going on, they explained that they've been getting the runaround from well companies and haven't had time to pursue it more aggressively. Every day, they've been coming over twice, 
once in the morning and once in the evening, to fill up multiple 5-gallon buckets from our hose. It's about 20 to 30 gallons each time. There are two adults and eight kids living in their home, along with a large garden and an excessive number of chicken and turkeys, which are, by the way, illegal in this area. It seems clear to us that their heavy and irresponsible water use brought this on themselves. Aside from being concerned that their increased water might deplete our aquifer and affect our own well, we're also irritated by their illegal rooster operation. The constant crowing is driving the entire neighborhood crazy. Supporting their setup feels frustrating, but we didn't want to just cut them off abruptly. Then, yesterday, we saw an older lady walking around their yard yelling and praying for their wells to start working again. That was the last straw for us. In our opinion, this is a serious problem that requires a serious, timely solution, and instead, they've got someone doing what looks like a rain dance. Last night, my wife told the mom next door that we couldn't provide water anymore and that they had 24 more hours to figure something out. The mom got upset and walked away mid-conversation, which only solidified our decision. It felt disrespectful and ungrateful. None of the other neighbors are willing to help either because they're all frustrated with the roosters. So the neighbors are on their own now. Am I the jerk for cutting off a family from using our water even though they have kids? Not the jerk. Lack of running water should absolutely be their top priority given how many living things they have that need it. You have some legitimate concerns and some serious reasons for doing it, but this is entirely on them. If they can't prioritize the one thing that absolutely everything needs to live and thrive, then that's on them. I'm quite sure they can go buy water at the store, so no one is in mortal danger here. Not the jerk. Don't run your well dry to water their farm. If you want to be neighborly still, give them drinking water for the humans. But they can go buy their own water for a few weeks while the well people figure it out. Also, might be a good idea to have your own well people give you an estimate on how much you can draw per day. Guy who flips out over his internet speed gets less. I work as a lead in the internet repair department for an internet provider. My job mainly involves assisting agents when they get stuck or handling escalated calls from customers who ask to speak to someone higher up, typically about internet issues like outages or equipment replacements. One day, I got a call from an agent whose customer wanted to speak to a supervisor because he wasn't getting the internet speeds he was paying for. This isn't uncommon, as many customers don't fully understand how various factors, like Wi-Fi versus wired connections, distance from the router, or even how their house is built, can affect internet speeds. When I looked at the customer's account, I saw that he was subscribed to a 100 megabit plan. The agent informed me that the customer was getting 437 megabits, which is way more than he was paying for. I told the agent to transfer the customer, who will call Darren, to me, so I could handle the situation. Darren came on the line, immediately yelling about how he wasn't getting what he was paying for, demanding a credit to his account, and saying he was recording the call for social media. I tried to explain that speed test results could vary, but Darren cut me off, threatening to report us to the FCC and file a lawsuit. He was beyond unreasonable. As I reviewed his account, I noticed that Darren had downgraded his internet plan from 500 megabit to 100 megabit just two days earlier. Sometimes these changes don't fully reflect until a modem is reset or a special tool is run to correct the speeds. When I tried to explain this to Darren, he cut me off again and kept ranting. He was insistent that we weren't delivering what he was paying for. Cue the malicious compliance. I calmly said, Sir, you're absolutely right, and I'm sorry that you're not getting the speeds you're paying for. I'll fix this right away. Since Darren was on a financial assistance plan that offered 100 megabits due to low income, I ran the tool that corrected the speed to match his plan. His internet, which had been delivering 437 megabits, was now reduced to the 100 megabit that he was actually paying for. I asked Darren how his speed test result looked now. He was furious. It's even worse than before. What kind of trick are you pulling? I responded, Sir, you said you weren't getting the speeds you're paying for, and you were right. You applied for a 100 megabit plan through a financial assistance program, and I've corrected it. It was wrong of us to be delivering 500 megabits when you were only paying for 100. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. After a few moments of silence, Darren muttered, This is ridiculous, and he hung up. I left detailed notes on his account for future agents to see, making sure it was clear that he wasn't entitled to any credit. Lesson learned. Be careful what you complain about. I destroyed my life chasing a fantasy, and it cost me everything real. I almost lost everything by chasing a fantasy, twice. 
I hurt the people closest to me, fell for illusions, and destroyed what really mattered, all because I couldn't see what was right in front of me. I've been married twice. My first marriage ended because I was too young and selfish to understand what commitment really meant. I cheated often, thinking I could have it all, marriage and excitement on the side. I hurt someone who didn't deserve it, and by the time I realized the damage I had done, it was too late. But even after the divorce, I hadn't changed. I jumped into a second marriage, convinced it would be different, convinced I would be different. But old habits die hard. I started pulling away from my wife, chasing excitement elsewhere, and falling back into old patterns. I traveled a lot for work, and I was reckless, sleeping around on almost every business trip, thinking I could keep everything separate. Then came someone else. She seemed to have everything my wife didn't. Child-free, never married, living the carefree, exciting life that I thought I wanted. I convinced myself that leaving my wife for her would make me happy, so I did. I left my wife for her, believing I had finally found what I was missing. But once I made that leap, the reality of who she was hit me hard. Turns out, she lived a very dark life. She had been sued for fraud, had a DUI and a suspended driver's license, and had an affair with another married man before me. The professional connection she bragged about? Non-existent. In fact, she had no real friends and was known as a homewrecker because our affair became public on social media. The illusion I had fallen for? Completely fake. I had destroyed my marriage for someone who wasn't even close to the person I thought she was. The affair being made public through social media made everything worse. Suddenly, everyone knew. The fallout wasn't just in my personal life, it was everywhere. People saw me differently and I had to deal with that shame on top of everything else. Despite it all, my wife and I never officially divorced. We had kids together and every time I visited, we would reconnect, sometimes even physically. It was messy and painful, but deep down, I don't think either of us ever truly let go. Eventually, I came clean. I told her the truth, that I wanted to make things right and do it proper this time. I didn't deserve her forgiveness, but she gave me another chance, on her terms. We started counseling together, and let me tell you, counseling is not a quick fix. It's brutal. You can't hide behind lies in that room. You have to face everything, the raw truth about who you've become. The hardest part wasn't admitting what I had done, it was hearing the truth from her, hearing how deeply I had hurt her and facing the reality of the damage I'd caused. That's the part that sticks with me. The wounds don't heal overnight and the process is slow. So slow that even now, I know I'm still working to earn back the trust that I shattered. We started going on date nights again, being more present for each other, trying to build new memories. What I learned is that fixing a relationship isn't about grand gestures. It's about showing up every day in the small moments, even when it feels fragile, even when it's hard. I've stopped chasing fantasies. The relief of no longer living a double life is something I didn't expect, but the scars I left behind won't ever fully heal. I've learned that chasing illusions costs you everything real, and I'm living with those choices. I'm not looking for advice or sympathy. I just needed to get this off my chest. Maybe some of you have been in the same place, chasing something temporary at the expense of what's real. I learned too late what it truly costs. Thank you for letting me share this. It's been a long time coming. Am I the jerk for not changing our reservation to accommodate my sister's new boyfriend? We had a group date night with me, my wife, her best friend, and her husband, my sister, and her new boyfriend, Tyler. The plan was to go to a sushi place that my wife and her friend picked. Since it was a Saturday night and we had a larger party, my wife had to put her credit card down for the reservation. On the way to the restaurant, my sister sent a message in the group chat suggesting we meet at a different restaurant instead, completely ignoring our reservations. My wife told her that we couldn't switch because of the cancellation fee. My sister argued that Tyler doesn't eat fish and proposed that we all chip in for the cancellation fee to go somewhere else. My wife's best friend wasn't having it and said it was rude to cancel the reservation with less than 30 minutes to go. She insisted we stick to the original plan and head to the sushi restaurant. Tyler and my sister showed up late and Tyler immediately announced that they were delayed because he had to stop somewhere else to eat before arriving. He was rude to both us and the waitstaff when the restaurant didn't have the beers he wanted on tap. Despite already having eaten, he ordered some ginger barbecue wings, hated them, and complained about them throughout the meal. We didn't engage much with him after that, but the night got worse when he got grumpy about my wife, her friend, and her husband speaking in Spanglish. They're all Latino, and their conversation wasn't hard to follow, even for me. I'm white, as are my sister and Tyler. Tyler, however, asked them to speak in English when someone used the word mas, which was ridiculous. 
The whole dinner was a mess because of his attitude. Later that week, Tyler broke up with my sister, blaming her and our family for being rude to him and calling her spoiled. When my sister told me, I said it was no loss because Tyler was a jerk. She shot back that my wife and I were the real jerks for sticking to the sushi plans instead of switching restaurants like she suggested. I told her we weren't about to cancel reservations for one person with just 20 minutes notice and that Tyler was rude and childish. I also said I was glad he broke up with her so I wouldn't have to see his face again. Then my mom texted me saying I needed to apologize because my sister had been crying all day over the breakup. I told my mom that if she had met Tyler, she would feel the same way I did. But my mom still thinks I'm the jerk for saying mean things about Tyler in case they get back together. Am I the jerk for saying what I did about Tyler and refusing to cancel the sushi reservations? Not the jerk. This guy sounds like a giant baby and your sister should have been appalled by his rudeness to her friends and family, not to mention the waitstaff, rather than trying to blame you. Never feel bad about assisting and your sibling breaking up with a trash person. My wife is cheating on me with her gaming friend. I, 26 male, and my wife, female 25, have been married for just under two years. We've been together for over five years and we have a daughter together who's turning one next month. I started to see a change in our relationship about a month after our daughter was born when I went back to work. She became increasingly distant with me and more withdrawn. Any sorts of affection stopped and I just felt like I was worthless to her. At the same time, she was spending an increasing amount of time on her maternity leave gaming with a group of online friends that she's known for a few years, most of which are male. I've never had a problem with this as I know the people in this group, but I felt this group of friends was being put first before me. And at the same time, there was one person in particular from the group that she was talking to a lot of the time, which I felt uncomfortable about. When I confronted her the first time about how I felt, she had admitted she lost feelings for me after our daughter was born, but that she wanted to make things work and that there was nothing going on with anyone from this group and that I should trust her. However, fast forward to a couple of weeks ago, I felt like things had not been improving. It was at this point that I checked her messages and found that she was having an emotional affair with someone from the group. I confronted her about this and she admitted to it. She said that she had lost feelings for me as she said before, and then she had gained feelings for this other person and that she let it get out of control. She said she wants to fix our relationship as she's worried that she will lose me and everything that we worked for and that she was so sorry for doing this to me. I'm not convinced that she's telling me the truth but I'm willing to try and rebuild our relationship for the sake of our daughter and the fact that I do still love her. However, I've told her that the only way I'm going to be able to rebuild any form of trust is if she stops all contact with this group of friends indefinitely and to not speak to them again. She thinks I'm not being fair about this. So tell me, am I the jerk for asking her to do this for me? She doesn't want to cut contact with the person she admits she got romantic feelings for? Were she sincere about wanting to fix and rebuild your relationship, that's a natural first step that she should take on her own accord. You should not even need to ask her for it. Not the jerk. She's staying with you because you are security. Don't let her use you like that. Not the jerk. She asked what it would take and you answered. Plus, wanting to continue contact means that she's putting herself in a position where she knows there is potential to revert to the affair, which means she is doing something that is putting the recovery of your relationship at risk rather than doing everything possible to make it successful again. And that's even if she wants to stop the affair at all, which is an open question. Not the jerk, but okay. To play the devil's advocate, cheating is the worst thing in a relationship in my humble opinion. But in have to say, there are details missing here. Yeah, in have to say that you can shut up. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Never stay with someone who's cheating on you. Would I be the jerk for losing every wrestling match I'm forced to attend on purpose? I'm 15, male. School has recently restarted all of the sports programs after almost a year of no or limited activity. Before that, I was part of the swim team, one of the smaller groups at our school. I love swimming and it really sucked that we couldn't go for such a long time. With the restart, the school also made a new system. Every student writes down three different after-school activities in order of interest. So first choice is your favorite. Second is your second favorite and so on. The teachers in charge of the groups then pick the students. First pick is students who already belong to the groups before lockdown. Second pick is then random and third pick is if there are still places left open in the group. Since I was part of the swim team before and put it down as my first choice, I would basically be guaranteed to get in. But now the results are out and I was placed in wrestling. 
I never even put that on my list at all, so I went to the teacher and asked what's going on. Turns out the teacher in charge of wrestling specifically requested me for whatever reason. Turns out my dad knows the wrestling teacher quite well and asked for me to be placed on the team. I know my dad hates that I prefer swimming. He always says it's not a real sport and that I should do some sport that actually gives me muscles. He constantly tells me I'm too skinny for a guy and has made several attempts to make me go to the gym to work out. I ask the teachers if I can still switch teams, but they say no. I also cannot just avoid the wrestling club because after school activities are mandatory. So last night I had a huge fight with my dad. I called him a jerk for forcing me to go to wrestling and that I'll just forfeit every single match I have to attend. He said that if I do that, he'll take away all my electronics and I will only be allowed to leave the house for school and nothing else. My mom says I should have the right to choose whatever sport I want, but now that I'm on the wrestling team, I should still do my best. Also, to not call my dad names. But I don't want to participate in something I have zero interest in. I was forced into it. Also, I was really looking forward to swimming again and meeting my teammates. Edit. Next week, I will talk to more teachers, guidance teacher, and also write to the principal. Guess I'll also try to talk to my mom again and maybe convince her. Worst case, I'll just go through with it and put in zero effort if no one listens to me. Edit 2. I talk to my mom again without my dad nearby. She still thinks I should give wrestling a try, but if I really want to change, she will support me. So next week, I'll go and talk first to my swim coach and the wrestling coach and hopefully get it resolved. Otherwise, I'll go further to the principal. I can post an update next week and tell you guys how things worked out. Some of you suggested I go to the newspaper or something, but I really don't feel comfortable blowing things up like that. Slandering the school would backfire 100%. I also got a few questions about the rule of afternoon activities being mandatory. So we have to do activities for two years total, but we're free to choose when we do them during high school. We can choose between a lot of club activities offered by the school, not just sports, but all kinds of activities. Music, art, reading, gardening, or even game design. School club activities are always free, and if you require financial assistance for like an instrument or something, I think you can get financial aid, but I don't really know the details. Additionally, if we attend a club or regular activity outside of school, we can also get credits for that. Just need to work it out with the teachers. We also don't get grades or anything. It's just noted on our final report. I also don't really know what happens if you don't complete them. Update. First things first, I'm back on the swim team for now. Today was really weird and awkward. First opportunity, I went to talk with my swim coach and explain the whole situation and that I'm not willing to stay on the wrestling team. He was pretty mad at my dad as well as the wrestling coach, so he took me to the secretary, explained the whole thing, and asked her to change the list. She was in turn quite mad because apparently the whole system is a big mess. I'm not even remotely the only student who was misplaced. So then the secretary called in my homeroom teacher. There was a lot of accusation. I was just standing there feeling awkward. Really weird to see three adults being mad at each other. In the end, I was basically told by all three to just ignore the whole thing and that I can just join the swim team if I want to. I figured that was it until the end of the school day then the wrestling coach had me come to his office. He gave me a long talk about how disappointed he is how he had high hopes for me, blah, blah, blah. I told him I really don't care and that he was a jerk for just ignoring what I wanted to do. To sum up, wrestling coach is mad at me, homeroom teacher is mad at me for complaining, swim coach mad at the school, and my dad is probably going to freak out when he hears that I won't wrestle. Oh well. Update. Mom told dad about the switch as he came home from work. He has so far completely ignored me. Not a single word. Actually, a nice outcome, I guess. Update. Last night, I had a talk with my dad and my mom. It was awkward. Dad apologized for the wrestling thing, but also said he wants me to grow up strong so that I can defend myself. He says swimming won't help me when I get in trouble. I was really confused about that because I never have been bullied or gotten in trouble or anything like that. Mom later told me that my dad used to get bullied a lot in high school, so he started working out in college and that helped him a lot. I guess he wanted me to do the same. It's really weird at home at the moment, but I guess he is not a complete jerk. Still kind of, but I don't know. Am I the jerk for yelling at my husband over bread? Whenever I buy something out of the ordinary with a specific dinner purpose in mind, my husband manages to find it and eat it. I'm sure if I were planning to bake something and bought yeast, I would come home to find him completely distended and surrounded in empty yeast packets. I usually stick to the same grocery list every week, and I feel like if I buy something out of the ordinary that is clearly an ingredient for a larger meal, 
he could at least ask before devouring it. Last night, I bought two baguettes, which I have only ever purchased to make French bread pizza for him and our kids. I bought these at 11 p.m., and they were not even here 12 hours when I saw them on the counter. With the first six inches ripped off of each loaf, scanned the house, and saw my husband chewing. If it had been one loaf, okay. If he had used a knife, maybe. But the fact that he didn't ask if they were going to be for dinner and then ripped off the top of them, this was just unforgivable. He insists I should tell him when I buy things if they are for a specific purpose. I say that I'm already taking on the burden of grocery shopping and cooking, and the least that he can do is ask. Am I the jerk here? Edit. 1. We have two snack cabinets that he's free to snack from, not to mention whatever's in the fridge. 2. The bread was in a cabinet that is mostly ingredients. 3. There was regular sandwich bread for the taking that was unharmed. 4. For those who have stated that this is raccoon-like behavior, it really does feel like I'm running a wildlife rehab operation, but the only patient is a 37-year-old software programmer. 5. To the dude who said that my husband is going to leave me for another woman who will give him peace, tell me you're still bitter about how things ended with Sheila without telling me you're still bitter about how things ended with Sheila. Update. I shared this with my husband and he accepts his jerk status and apologized. We're going to work on communicating better and he's going to work on his weaponized incompetence. He wants you to know he occasionally cooks rice and beans and lately has been making us late night quesadillas when the kids are asleep. But most of all, I was just hungry. My husband. <laughs> I was, yeah, he was hungry, all right. Not the jerk. OP shouldn't have to label every food item that comes into the house, especially since this is a pattern. The husband should learn to ask first. It's not hard to say, hey, are you saving these baguettes for something? Because if you're not, I want to tear six inches off each one of them and leave the mangled remains on the counter. It's like he's marking his territory. You're not the jerk. May I suggest that whenever he does this, you simply refuse to cook unless he goes to the store and replaces what he ate? Also, hang a sign on the kitchen. All food in the kitchen is for a specific purpose. Ask before mindlessly devouring. He won't stop until he realizes the problems his actions are causing you. You have to make this his problem. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.